All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the uh, PyTorch Conference Q&A uh, with Engineers series. My name is Justin Jeffers and I am a developer advocate at Meta. And I have some very special guests on with me today from both the Torch Rec team and the FSDP team. So I'm gonna have everyone go around the room and just do a quick inter um, introduction of themselves. So Colin, we'll start with you. Hi everyone, my name is Colin, Colin Taylor, and I'm one of the core authors of the Torch Rec library. Cool. And then Dennis. Hi, my name is Dennis Van I'm also another co-author of the Torch Rec Library. Great. And uh, we'll go with Rohan next. Hi, my name is Rohan, and I'm an engineer um, on the PyTorch distrib distributed team working on FSDP. Cool. And uh, Andrew. Yeah. Hey, I'm Andrew, and I'm also on the PyTorch distributed team working on FSDP with Rohan. Cool. So it's really exciting to have you all on to talk about your respective products and also you know give us some insights on how they work together and what's new for pytorch 2.0 um just a few little housekeeping items before we get started just want to call out that this is not just a one and done uh thing we have a whole bunch of different um uh, uh presentations that we're doing throughout uh the month of december and january so uh this afternoon, there's going to be another one uh, about uh, two point, PyTorch 2.0 export. So you should check that out with Yanan Chow. Uh, and if you're not following us on Twitter, please do so uh, at PyTorch. Um, and so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Colin. Uh, so you can um, get started and, and talk about uh, TorchRec. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, so just a, a kind of a brief overview of today. Um, so we're going to start by talking off Tor Torchrec. I'll give a brief presentation for about 15 minutes, pass it to the FSDP team, and then we're going to have 30 minutes of Q&A. So just a kind of a brief overview. So like we mentioned, I'm Colin, and this is my colleague and contributor, Dennis. Um, we work on Torchrec, which is PyTorch's newest domain library for recommend recommender and recommendation systems. So today we're gonna to give a brief overview of Torchrec, what it is, and then we're gonna go over some of the, a deep dive into Torchrec's core components, a few of them. Next, we're gonna go over a code walkthrough to talk about how you can transform your model with Torchrec um, and particularly the embedding layers. And finally, we're gonna go over some of the performance benchmarks showcasing the kind of um, speed ups you can expect from, from Torchrec. So first of all, what is Torchrec? Simply put, Torchrec is the, a domain library for PyTorch meant to take whatever is missing from PyTorch core to author large, performant, and easy to author um, recommend, recommender models. So first of all, it contains a few domain-specific um, concepts and components, including um, the recommender system data sets for research. It also includes, and most probably importantly, is the scalability piece of Torchrec, which enables model parallelism for the embedding layers. So this allows recommender system authors to scale and adjust their models from one GPU or one device all the way to 64, 128, and multi-node multi -node training, and as well as inference support. And finally, it's designed to be performant. It's designed to take fast recommender systems um, in research production. And this is in, used internally at Meta to power some of our, our lar largest recommender models. One of Torchrec's key components, like I mentioned earlier, is around um, model parallelism. And in particular, Torchrec focuses on the embedding layers of models, which as um, those of you familiar with rec recommender systems know, are one of the largest components and often the dominant size in terms of parameters of recommenders models. So what Torchrec allows you to do is utilize a technique called module swapping, where we're swapping uncharted embedding modules into sharded embedding modules. So what this means to give a, a concrete example is here we have a abstraction called embedding cl bag collection, which is simply a collection of NN dot embedding bags in PyTorch and swaps it out through Torchrec's embedding bag collection sharder. Torchrec does execute its model parallelism through these sharders. And this will create a sharded embedding bag collection, 
which depending on the way that you tell Protrack to shard will effectively execute the same operation, but in model parallel um, and where the model is sharded in, in, in various ways. So just a, we'll, we'll go into more detail about these, but two of these examples include data parallel or replicated where the, the model is not sharded, but only replicated or row wise where the embedding table is sharded row wise across, across devices. And the sharded module in particular contains the necessary collective calls to move this module from a data parallel to a model parallel and back to a data parallel mechanism um, to sort of execution strategy. So this, we, Tortrek, we'll, we'll go into this in a little bit, um, has, has names for these abstractions called the input dist, lookup and output dist. So that's sort of the, the, uh, the core piece, one of the core pieces of Tortrek's model parallelism strategies. Some of the features which we'll, we'll dive into deeper into a minute include um, batch embeddings, fused optimizers, and input batch pipeline, as well as Tortrek includes many features which we don't have time to unfortunately today, such as the jagged tensor abstraction, hierarchical sharding, collective quantization, embedding quantization, automated planning, and HBM or DDR caching. Let's take a deep dive into some of Tortrek's core components. So first of all, like we mentioned, model-based parallelism is a one of the Tortrek's main features. And this is relevant as your embedding models scale up. We've, we've seen internally and many other um, companies and research projects have seen that the convergence met metrics very much improve as your embedding tables grow in size, both in terms of the number of number of rows as well as the dimensionality used to capture um, the features for the users, items, or the entity you're, you're trying to represent. And importantly as well, we, this needs to be fast. Faster training leads to more ide ideas tested and greater innovation. So this is kind of like we mentioned briefly before, one of Tortrek's core uh, abstractions for model-based parallelism. Tortrek contains abstractions for uh, shardable modules and we use these sharders, once again, to swap these uncharted modules out towards sharded modules. And the sharded modules key abstractions, like we briefly mentioned, are the input distribution, the operator, which is typically an embedding lookup, and the output distribution. The input and output distributions are basically what allow Tortrek to go from a replicated or data parallel world to the model parallel world and back to the data parallel world for future processing of these em embedding based features. And Tortrek does this through Tortrek sharders, which are subclassed from Tortrek's module sharder, which it can even be composable within themselves. So one thing to note in contrast to FSTP, which we'll talk about a little bit later, is Tortrek is pretty much specific to embedding modules. There, there are some exceptions, but, but Tortrek's bread and butter is around sharding particular shardable modules. So this is another example of the embedding bag collection and the embedding bag collection sharder and the sharded embedding bag collection. Here we can see um, some of the, the ways that Tortrek can actually do the sharding, do the model, model, model parallelism. So first of all, one of the options is data parallel, which actually is not model parallelism in that the embeddings are not sharded at all, but rather replicated across all ranks. Another common paradigm is table-wise, where we shard each table separately on a single rank. Next, we have row-wise, which as the name suggests, shards the, splits the table up row-wise and places one shard on each of the available ranks. And Analogously, column-wise does the same thing, but sharding the column. And finally, Tortrek also supports what we call hierarchical sharding, which means that first we select a host and then apply either table-wise, row-wise, or column-wise within that host. So obviously this is only relevant in multi-node or multi-host training. And the key ability that Tortrek gives you to do is automatically creates the sharded modules with the necessary collective calls to ensure numerical correctness um, and performance 
for you. That's that's the sort of the, the magic that Torchak provides. Another key, um, another key abstraction Torchak provides, which is truly powered by by FBGem, is called table batched embeddings. So what this means is that in a typical recommendation system model you might have many tables, dozens or even hundreds of, of embedding tables. And in, if you're using vanilla PyTorch, each of these will be, each of these lookups will be in its own, um, its own kernel, which obviously can be, can be very expensive. So what FBGem provides is this table batched kernel, which allows you to do all of these embedding table lookups in a single embedding kernel. And this alone is actually responsible, especially as the number of embedding tables grows, responsible for a large improvement in, in, in speed. Another key, um, key aspect of performance that also we leverage F the FPGEM um, library for, which incidental, if I haven't mentioned, is part of PyTorch as well, and you can find it at PyTorch slash FPGEM, is op what we call optimizer fusion. And what this means is that often we can update the optimizer in the same fused kernel as when the backward pass computes the gradient and so actually apply the gradient through the optimization step. So of course, since we can do this, we don't need to allocate memory for the gradient and it's, it's also faster. Um, so this allows us to basically save, save memory and put larger models on the same amount of hardware. And implementations for common optimizers, such as Atom and Atagrad, and something that Meta uses heavily called rowwise Atagrad, where there's a single slot variable per row, um, are implemented inside of, of FBGEM and, and Torchic. Another key um, performance optimization Torchic makes super easy is overlapping GPU communications and compute. So obviously, this is a common paradigm in GPU training, where we will try to to use utilizing multiple uh, CUDA streams, um, overlap, overlap parallel aspects of the, of the comms and compute in order to, to have end-to-end -end speed ups. So Tortrek actually provides something called train pipeline, which will create three separate CUDA streams. The first one is the um, device, hosted device transfer for batch plus two. Secondly, the data distribution batch plus one. Um, as we go from data parallel to model parallel. And finally, the forward, backward, and, and updates of, of the current batch, the, the sort of the, the mainstream. And we can see in this next slide a trace, a GPU trace of this in action. So on the top, we can see that this, the same trace without pipelining. And the, the next trace we can see with pipelining. So we can see the number of streams increased. And these arrows are indicating wh where, the, where the actual execution, the programmatic execution is happening. So here we, we have the, on the bottom, we can see the batch B plus two on device, which is pipelined, i.e. done asynchronously with the other operations, as well as the input dist of, of B plus one and the compute. And so like, like it's shown on the slide, we're actually, we're seeing, you know, obviously big speed ups just from, from pipeline and Torchrek makes this super easy through its train pipeline abstraction. So next, I want to do a brief code walkthrough about how you can take your vanilla PyTorch model and use Torchrek. What one key key benefit of Torchrek, by the way, is it's just PyTorch. Since it's a domain library, you can essentially do any PyTorch model and use Torchrek um, to speed up your and, and and shard your embedding layers. So first of all, this is sort of what what this will look like. We're importing Torchrek, importing. Um, DLRM, with, if you're not familiar, is the MLPerf recommendation systems benchmark. So we can see we're authoring our embeddings through Tortrex embeddings, embedding bag collection, which again are just simple n and dot embedding bags that are using these configs to create. And we specify the relevant embedding dims, numbed embeddings, the feature names, et cetera. And next, we're actually using these embeddings inside of the DLRM implementation, which also exists in, in, in Tortrex which is just a, a, the same implementation that exists on the MLPerf site um, with the, the relevant, um, the relevant uh, parameters. And then next, we're, this is where we go into the, the core Torchrek part. So we have setting up the distributed environment. Um, we're using the nickel-based backend. 
And then we use Tortrex key abstraction called distributed model parallel or DMP. And this will wrap the model similar to DDP, if you're familiar with that, to make the model distributed. And then you can simply call distributed model forward um, and, and backward just like you, you, you do. And this will basically apply the sharding. We have an automated planner to, to actually do the placement um, out of the box for you. So it makes it super easy to, to go from uncharted to sharded um, arbitrarily using Tortrick. I know we're running short on time, so I'll briefly mention some of the, the performance benchmarks. So in the blue here, we have the uncharted vanilla PyTorch model. In the yellow, we have the Tortrek NFBGEM optimized model. This is once again using the DLRM benchmark. The left column shows the, and this is all on, on, on single device, by the way, shows the embedding tables reduced 32x, so it can actually fit on a device. And we can see the 30, some pretty big speed ups um, for moving to Tortrek and FBGEM. And we can also actually fit the device using UVM caching and UVM um, onto fit a smaller device onto a single rank, effectively using host memory through this. And we can see the relevant um, speed ups. UVM caching, by the way, is storing the underlying data on host memory and using the unified virtual memory system, paging this to basically cache the relevant rows inside of um, the high bandwidth memory when it's needed. And next we can see the same model, the DLRM model, but in the multi-GPU setting where we can fit the full fit the full model and we can see the performance going up to 5 million records per second um, with a large enough batch size. So with that, that's all I had today. Um, just a quick call to action we have, please check out our GitHub, um, check out our documentation as well as the benchmarks. And this is a, at this point, a, a, a large uh, collaborative effort. Please make a PR and give it a try. We have dozens of contributors, including many externally, and we'd love to have you be part of the Torture community. Um, and with that, I'd like to pass the presentation over to Rohan, who's going to talk about FSDP, and we'll be back in 15 minutes to, for the Q&A part. Thanks, Colin. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Rohan, and I'm joined here by Andrew. And today we're going to talk about fully sharded data parallel um, and production readiness. So getting into some of the agenda, we'll talk about the motivation and introduction to FSDP, or fully sharded data parallel. Then we'll talk about some features that we've built out for production readiness. Then we'll go over some actual concrete results on production workloads. And finally, we'll discuss some next steps for FSDP. So kind of getting into the motivation, why do we need uh, fully sharded data parallel? There's been a bunch of studies in academia and industry showing that scaling deep learning model size um, results in accuracy improvement as model size, data, si data set size, and compute amount, amount grows. And in only about three years, model size has grown from 10,000 times from BERT with around 110 million parameters to Megatron 2 with around 1 trillion parameters. At the same time, generic, scalable, and easy to use distributed training is quite tough. It's a hard software problem to solve and requires our tools to be not limited to particular architectures. Uh, we also want tools that are user-friendly and require only minimal code changes to scale the model size. And finally, we want production-ready training, which means that our tools should be efficient, reliable, easy to use, and able to scale. And new techniques such as FSDP have actually unlocked this sort of new model scale that we want. Now we'll briefly go over FSDP, or fully sharded data parallel, and how it works. Uh, FSDP implements data parallelism as an NN.module wrapper while sharding parameters, gradients, and optimizer states across workers to enable larger models. FSDP preserves the simplicity of data parallel training, but it removes the requirement that your model needs to fit on a single GPU, which is typically the case with applications such as DDP. So how does FSDP actually work? FSDP changes the communication schedule of vanilla data parallel training. How it works is that for each FSDP instance, the data and or activations are fed in similar to traditional data parallel training. However, 
Since FSDP maintains parameters, gradients, and optimizer states in a sharded manner, uh, we first need to unshard the parameters and reconstruct the full local module. This is done through an all-gather communication operation. After that, we run the forward pass locally, similar to a traditional torch.nn.module. Then we reshard parameters after the forward pass is over and pass our activations to the next FSDP unit. And that's how the forward pass works. The backward pass is quite similar. Um, before the backward pass for a particular FSDP instance, we unshard the parameters through another all gather operation. Then we run a local backward pass through the autograd engine, similar to a traditional nn.module. After gradients are computed, we reshard the parameters to free up memory again. Next, there's a reduce scatter operation to actually synchronize and reshard gradients across all of the workers. At this state, we have sharded parameters and sharded gradients, and we run an optimizer step in the same fashion as local training, but the optimizer acts on sharded parameters and sharded gradients. Next, we'll go into some features that we've built out in FSDP for production readiness. The first that I want to discuss is native mixed precision training. In mixed precision training, we're able to run computation and communication in reduced precision. And the API is very flexible, allowing users to control the parameter type, reduction type, which controls gradient reduction, as well as the buffer type of their model. This means that users can have parameters, gradient communication, and buffers all in different precision in their FSDP training. We've also built out robust model and optimizer state checkpointing, which provides users configurable and scalable ways to save and load model checkpoints. We have a state dict type API that allows users to configure which state dict API to use for their optimizers and model. And users can select between taking a full state dict, which is similar to a local nn.module checkpoint, a local state dict that only captures shards of parameters, or a sharded state dict that also captures shard parameter shards but enables resharding uh, of FSTP instances. For example, you'd want to use sharded state dict if you plan to save your FSDP model and then reload it into an environment with a smaller world size. Finally, we've also built out activation checkpointing interoperability, which reduces memory consumption due to large activations. As a reminder, FSDP shards parameters, gradients, and optimizer states, but a significant consumer of memory is also activation sizes, which FSDP doesn't natively do anything about. This is where activation checkpointing comes in, which trades off compute for reduced memory usage by freeing and recomputing activations as they're needed. We're able to compose activation checkpointing using the apply activation checkpointing API with uh, FSDP models, which allow users to save memory due to activation sizes as well. I'll talk about a few more features that we've built out for production readiness now. We've also built out initialization on the meta device. This means that users can actually initialize their FSDP models without having to initialize the local model on the CPU or GPU first. This is done through the deferred init API where the user can simply create a model and wrap it with the deferred init API, which does not initialize it on the CPU or GPU. When this deferred model is then passed into FSDP, FSDP takes care of initializing the model layer by layer as, as parameters are sharded. This dramatically speeds up the initialization time of large models. Finally, we've built out several memory and throughput optimizations. These are various configurations to improve throughput and avoid memory over allocation. For example, we've built out a backward prefetch function that allows users to overlap communication and computation in the backward pass. Finally, we've also built out a rate limiter, which can be enabled with the limit all gathers flag, which avoids memory over allocation. Now I'll go into some results that we've seen on production workloads. First, we tested FSDP with activation checkpointing on a Flava model, which is a multimodal foundational model. We scaled up Flava to about 10 billion parameters. With DDP, the maximum scale that we were able to hit was around 3 billion parameters, and FSDP, along with activation checkpointing, was, was needed to allow us to scale to 4.8 and 10 billion parameters on a single node. As you can see, 
Activation checkpointing allows us to scale the batch size um, such that we can achieve more than a 2x performance improvement. Next, we tested FSDP mix precision on a XLMR 700 million parameter workload across two nodes. Using FP32 precision compared to AutoCast and FSDP BFloat 16 mix precision, mix precision was able to achieve nearly a 3x speedup over the FP32 baseline. Next, we also tested mix precision on a larger 8 billion parameter vision encoder workload. For this, FSDP's BFloat 16 mix precision was able to give nearly a 2x speedup over the baseline. I'll also note that testing with mixed precision and using BFloat 16 resulted in no, no accuracy loss for either model. Finally, we also tested out meta device initialization on a very large GPT 15 billion parameter model. Due to avoiding time um, in spent in CPU initialization, deferred init improved initialization time by nearly 1,000x. Finally, we also tested the rate limiter on an 11 billion parameter workload. With the rate limiter on, our QPS improved by nearly 3x, and this is due to avoiding thrashing and fragmentation that the CUDA caching allocator would need to run expensive defragmentation operations to fix. Finally, I'll talk about some next steps and plans that we have for FSTP. First, we want to improve memory and performance debugging tool. It's quite hard for users today to understand what are the performance characteristics of their FSTP application, why performance is slow, how to improve it, and the different tools and features that we offer to use. This is why we want to build out improved tooling in this area. We also want to harden different features for FSTP such as providing robust support for training with multiple optimizer parameter groups. Finally, we're always looking to battle test FSDP on more workloads from various domains and also looking at building out auto-tuning APIs to figure out how to find the most performant configuration given a user's workload, hardware, and network topology. This is quite difficult today as users need to run experiments and figure out what is the optimal configuration for their FSDP training. With auto-tuning, our hope is that all of this can be automated. And thank you. That concludes my presentation. All right. Thank you very much. I'm going to bring Colin and uh, Dennis back on. And um, yes, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I was noticing there's a couple questions we had in the audience. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, start just bringing them up. So uh, we had a question from Ram. He had two questions. Uh, first, he just wanted to know if you could talk a little bit more about the inference side for TorchRec. Um, I don't know in, spe in specific, but if there's anything that you can share there, that would be great. Sure. Yeah, no, I, I'm happy to take that question. Um, yeah, I think as Ram highlighted, a lot of the discussion um, in these presentations is really about the training side and optimizing training. We do support um, inference, um, though it is definitely a younger product. Uh, segment for us. There's really a couple ways you could do this today. One is that you can take to traditionally the uncharted module. So again, we're just taking standard PyTorch modules, models. We're then uh, swapping modules that for distributed training environment. And you can effectively think that, well, what can we do for inference? You could go back to the original model because it's uh, numerically consistent. So you could take the original model. And if you're doing something like CPU inference, you could effectively JIT script that would be kind of the traditional route. Um, but obviously, if you want to get to a distributed runtime environment, what you can do is we also support a couple other things. So in the most advanced setup, and I think we have an example on our website um, for DLRM inference on GPUs. But what you would do is basically we actually support swapping out modules for uh, inference optimized versions. So these are quantized versions. So instead of having traditional training, where you'd have like FP16 or FP32 training, we'll have in eight implementations. And they're just for the forward pass. So they're highly optimized for inference only. They're going to use for inference. And then we can use a combination of what's called torch deploy. So the idea is that, in essence, that in your C++ runtime environment, um, which is typical for inference, you can actually call into the forward Python implementation, implementation of this module using torch deploy, which basically spins up a Python thread um, inside the C++ environment. Um, so that's sort of uh, you know a complex area. Um, we are trying to make it easier, though. And I think the reason maybe you ask, like, why couldn't I just do this whole thing in C++? Why don't you push deploy today? That's mainly that the 
sharded versions of these modules are very difficult to get a JIT IR. Um, but we are currently actively, aggressively um, investing in this area. So I think the goal would be that um, just like you would a traditional uncharted module, you, which you could get to a JIT IR, you'd be able to do the same thing with a sharded torch track module. Yeah, and, and just to add to what Dennis said, thanks, Dennis. Um, so it depends if you want to do inference on CPU or GPU. The we have a few examples in the in the GitHub on on the examples directory. We actually have an examples directory for um, DLRM, like Dennis was mentioning, and this is actually for for GPU inference. Um, and then Torch Script would be the recommended approach for CPU inference. And just there's also a retrieval example that shows how you can you could do this um, for a retrieval model, including some of the transforms you might want to take as you go from training to inference as well. And are these examples um, underneath the uh, GitHub uh, PyTorch slash TorchRec repo? Exactly. In the TorchRec repo slash examples, the, there's a set of, I think, seven or eight examples there. And one is labeled inference and one is retrieval, which effectively includes um, at least like a uh, an inference type module post transformed, yeah, as well. Cool, great. I just dropped the link to the uh, the TorchRec uh, GitHub repository into the chat. So for those of you who are interested in learning about the those different inference optimizations for GPU and CPU, please go ahead and check those out. Great. Um, so we had another question from Ram, uh, basically saying, given that uh, Rexis is moving towards GNNs, does uh, TorchRec provide any specific sharding for GNNs? Um, so not exactly. I mean, TorchRec embedding sharding could be used in GNNs. I believe there is a, yeah, so we don't have anything, any, any examples. Um, I, I have heard chatter of people using GNNs and, and Tortrek. Um, I can try to dig those up, um, but there's nothing that shouldn't make this unusable in Tortrek. I think one of the nice things about Tortrek is it's not its own DSL. It is just native PyTorch. So you can shard the embeddings using Tortrek. Um, yeah, I don't know, Dennis, if you have other context to add, but. No, no, <clears throat> no, not really. And, and I think I think you said it well. Um, I also think that I think you kind of were hitting on right. Like these are standard PyTorch modules, so you could use TorchRec for the components that TorchRec has supported modules, and you can use things like, for example, FSDP um, to shard the other parts of the module automatically because they'll work with any module. So I think you have a lot of flexibility here, but it's definitely an area of interesting research. Great. Um... Just so everybody who's watching knows, this, this is your chance to ask the engineers some questions. So don't be shy. Go ahead and uh, paste some questions in the chat and uh, we'll definitely uh, ask the bunch and get you some answers. Um, in the meantime, though, uh, I actually have a couple um, just um, questions that I wanted to ask. So, um, you know, I know that in this particular presentation, we have both of uh, representation from TorchRec and from FSDP. So, um, you know, is there a reason why we did that? Can these two products work together? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's a great question. This is actually something we've heard a lot of, for people who have interest in, um, in both of these libraries. Um, I'll go ahead and then I can, you know, folks from Rohan and Andrew, please, please share. So first of all, absolutely, you know, th these can work together. Um, we, in general, we recommend, um, a, presumably, you might want to shard the embeddings with Tortrek and shard what we would call the dense, i.e. the non-embeddings with FSDP is the typical paradigm people use, but obviously that's not set in stone. Um, we are, this is possible today, and it's also a work in progress, which there is a, on the Tortrek um, issues page, we have a design doc out for what we call Tortrek composability, which part of the motivation here is to better integrate with other PyTorch existing distributed frameworks such as um, FSDP, um, which kind of has more details in here, but we're adhering to like the, the same contracts to make this easier to do more arbitrary and flexible sharding um, using both paradigms. But even today it's possible and there is some support. And if you want to, you know, feel free to open up a GitHub issue or reach out to us and we can we can point you to those resources. Um, I don't know if other folks have context they want to add. Yeah, I think what Colin said pretty much summed it up. Uh, yeah, we are working 
uh, looking towards next half, working on more composability, and definitely want to make the support with Torch Rack um, a lot smoother. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Um, not really a question, but we had a good comment from the um, from the community. This comes from LinkedIn. Uh, Navid says, "Great innovation. I love working with PyTorch, and look forward to many more projects." So. Um, yeah, thanks for, for taking an interest in PyTorch and thanks for using it with your projects. So um, I'm always happy and excited to hear what people do um, with the technologies that are being created for uh, machine learning and AI. So thank you. Um, let's see. Yes. So I have another question. Um, so regarding TorchRec, um, you know, what kind of hardware do I need to run uh, these TorchRec models? Yeah, good question. So Tor Torturek is mostly primarily designed to run on GPUs, and you'll see the biggest speedups here. And obviously, being built on the FPGM kernels, these are primarily um, for NVIDIA GPUs. Um, I kn do know that, so 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 today, in order to use Torturek, you'll need an NVIDIA GPU, or you can run this on CPU, but you won't see, obviously, the speedups that Torturek is designed for on CPU. It's primarily meant for prototyping, but definitely possible. And we do have users on the inference side using Torturek today that are running on inference CPU and trained on GPU is another common paradigm um, that we've seen. Um, we are, Epidem in particular, is looking into adding support for AMD. Um, and potentially, we might add um, Apple Silicon in the future, although that's that's not an active development, to my knowledge. Great. Um, and then lastly, uh, you know, can I run any sort of, um, can I run any PyTorch model on uh, that use and use Torch Rec? Yeah, this is a great question. So yes, effectively. Um, I mean, I'm sure there's there's exceptions, um, but in general, that's what Torch Rec is designed to be. It's just designed through module swapping to replace the PyTorch components, which will make things faster and set up the comms to move to this model parallel environment. So, you know, the short answer, yes, obviously there are, there are corner cases <laughs> within there. Um, but yes, that's 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 by design. Great, yeah. So it's it's nice that you've got a little bit of flexibility there. Um, and I imagine there's some tuning that you have to do to, or, or is there any sort of tuning that you have to do to set it up to, you know, or is it sort of like a plug and play kind of like, all right, I want to just use this model with it. Um, like, how does that look like? Yeah, yeah, great question. So it's designed to be as plug and play as the author desires. So that, for example, the example we showed today, which is mimicked that we have an online tutorial, like I mentioned, that you can take a look and play around with is designed to be to be like that. And this plug and playness will sort of work with any available hardware that you have um, utilizing some of the building blocks from the PyTorch distributed team. Um, but it's also possible to constrain the model as, as much as you want. So the plug and play version, for example, assumes you want Torchrec to automatically decide what's the optimal sharding and compute kernels, i.e., like optimizer fusion, et cetera, that you want. And but but this can also be constrained um, or and and still to automated planning, or we have mechanisms to do to do um, direct. So it, it really is up to the author, but for the entry level users, we definitely recommend or just getting your feet wet, trying the automated system plug and play. Um, Ability that Torchrec provides. Yeah, I don't know, Dennis. If you have anything else you wanted to, want wanted to add? No, I mean that's that's well worded. Um, and I also would uh, always challenge our users if you find that um, there's some optimization. I think particularly in our automated planning, all the time people identify case edge cases that we don't plan for well uh, in our heuristics, and uh, we make those adjustments. So I almost challenge you to find a uh, the edge cases for us. It really helps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just, just one thing I'll mention, you know, another example is like, so the, the updated uh, DLRM benchmark, the reference implementation is going to be using Torchrec. This is just landing in the Facebook research DLRM code base, which is the source of truth for that. And they, there's a good example there for tweaking the automated planning. So you can change things like um, how much memory do I want to leave available for activations to optimize. Um, and you can pass in your expected batch size. So you can, you can really tweak this um yeah yeah and we we would definitely welcome improvements there it's obviously an element auto ml ish area of, of active research um so yeah <laughs> great um and so uh you know i'm gonna ask everyone uh on the call oh, actually before i get to that let me just say um 
please keep the questions coming. Um, we have a, a few more minutes left. So if you have, uh, if you're in the middle of typing up your question, please uh, we'll finish up the wording and, and hit that send button. Um, but before, uh, while I give everyone time to, to write their final questions in, um, I wanna go around the room and ask everybody, like what is the thing that they're most excited about of the, the new set of features that release? So like with like, Dennis and Colin, like, what is the thing that you're most excited about the community getting a hold of that is part of the updates for Torch Rec? And likewise for you, Rohan and Andrew, what are the things that you're most excited about the community getting hands on with with FSDP updates? So I'll start with uh, Dennis. Put me on the spot. Um, I think <laughs> I think I think it's kind of hit on. Actually, I think the inference question was a really good one. Um, it's an area of really active research today. Um, so I think we have some of the quantized modules out there. Um, we also are sort of started to tweak and think about how to bring a lot of the planning optimizations to to inference uh, it's a very different environment so um but i you know i would just say that the incremental steps another big thing i think is the optimizer fusion so we have this nice api and i think it's actually in collaboration with the folks from fsdp and pytorch distributed um, we're thinking about ways that uh, model authors can attach um, their optimizer prior to processing a short track and that just sort of makes this um, optimizer fusion much more um, transparent to the user. So, yeah. Great, okay. Uh, Colin, what about? Yeah, no, I think it's a great question. There's a few different areas I I'm excited about. So, you know, Torchrek, we announced in February and we've seen a lot of interest and adoption, which we've been really excited about, both in terms of different companies, researchers using Torchrek, as well as companies, and researchers um, contributing. So one area is we've been partnering increasing with NVIDIA um, that is excited to have increased <laughs> adoption of, of some NVIDIA software and hardware um, through utilizing Torchrek. So we've, we're, we're having some great partnerships to use Torchrek and some of their embedding innovations in addition to augmenting FPGM. So that's one area. Um, another area is a, a RC that's what's driven primarily externally right now called Dynamic Embeddings which is sort of a different paradigm that uses um, parameter servers to actually store the global embeddings and amortizes the result through prefetching um, and uses the Tortrek sharding in the basically the stages of the pipeline that actually are the running the forward and backward passes and as well as um, basically mapping from global IDs to local IDs to har handle arbitrarily large um, embedding tables, which is awesome to see. So this is this is what the contributors I know are using internally in production today, and seeing them add this to the Torchrek library is is great. And we've we've heard interest from other practitioners who have interest in these same innovations. So it's fantastic to see. And the and then third and fourth things I'll mention. One is composability, which we talked about briefly. We really want to scale up to. You know, we we we've done trillion size models primarily motivated by primarily dominated by the embedding parameters, but we want to do both by transformers with, you know, with uh, with embedding tables. So, so this comp composability effort with Torchrek and FSDP is really exciting, and we hope to showcase some of these examples. And the fourth thing is inference. I think one thing we've seen as we worked with a bunch of different companies in particular is that the inference stories for each company looks very different. And the training side, I think, is much more homogenous. Inference side is very different. So we've seen companies, you know, use Onyx to um, native PyTorch with TorchScript to package and deploy the, the example we have up on up on online for inference and um, yeah there's a lot more we can we can add here and there's a lot of the innovation is is sort of like an inference side um, to help internally meta as well as externally um, get these models into, into production so no that's a lot but that's that's my answer. <laughs> Great. No, thanks. There's, it's just a sign of, of just how much innovation and how many new things are being built. Um, yeah, there's a lot to be excited about. Um, okay, I'm going to switch over to uh, FSDP. Uh, and Rohan, you're up. Uh, what, what are you most excited about? Yeah, um, I'm in particular, I think, excited about a lot of the performance enhancing features that we've built out. So we released FSDP as beta in 1.12. And a big thing for us to get to beta was to address, uh, one, a lot of the usability issues that we got from feedback after 1.11, and two, figure out how to really push the performance of FSTP, which I think is really important to us since we want FSTP to work on very large workloads, scale to you know like up to even 100, hundreds of billions of parameters uh, across potentially hundreds or even thousands of GPUs. So 
we really took a lot of time and thought about what we need for FSDP performance. And obviously the whole story is, you know, only 1% written right now, but we've released a lot of features recently that I think will be really helpful. So in particular, I think the mixed precision that we discussed uh, has continually seen like a bunch of speed ups and memory improvements across pretty much all of the different workloads that we've tested. So we're really excited to get that into users' hands and get them to try it out um, on their various architectures and configurations and see if they also end up seeing similar results to what we saw in our testing. Um, I'm also excited around the improvements around communication that we've done. So for example, uh, backward prefetching to improve the communication computation overlap in the backward pass uh, has really helped like, because when we're looking at these traces, we always see, uh, you know, FSDP does have somewhat expensive communication compared to DDP, which only does all reduce FSDP does like all gather and reduce scatter as well. So we work quite a bit on figuring out how to overlap that and looking at traces, we'd see a lot of times like communication is the main bottleneck that's exposed. Um, so backward, working on backward prefetching to mitigate that has also led to a lot of improvements around performance. Um, so that's another thing that I'm excited about. And probably Andrew has a lot more to add as well. Cool. And just before Andrew, uh, you go, I just want to just say final call for questions. I see we only have one uh, question left from the community. So uh, this is the last call for questions. So if you have a question, please go ahead and do it. Remember, this is your opportunity to ask the engineers. So uh, don't be shy and ask away. Uh, so with that, Andrew, please, uh, what are you most excited about? Yeah, I think a lot of things that Rohan said, especially around performance, are really exciting. I think one thing we did well this half and probably looking towards next half is better understanding the CUDA caching allocator that dictates exactly how memory works for PyTorch. And once we got FSDP to synergize better with the caching allocator, we were able to deliver like some pretty big performance improvements. And I think as we go into next half and we're improving a lot of the memory tooling around understanding the caching allocator, understanding the workloads, we'll be able to do this in a more systematic way and also help users do it in like a self-serve manner as well. So I think, uh, yeah, that, that gives like pretty big performance improvement. So uh, I think that's the most exciting thing. Great, yeah, performance improvements, especially when you know your, your data set gets larger and larger and larger. Uh, any sort of improvement to performance is, is gonna like bring a ton of benefits. So um, I can see why that's really exciting to, uh, especially like some some people that I've spoken to, I won't call people out on stream, but, uh, you know, are working with incredibly large data sets. And so they always get excited when, uh, you know, some sort of performance that update comes through that th it's very minimal effort, but like decreases the amount of time it takes is is just a huge win. Cool. Okay. So uh, we had one uh, question left from the, the community. Um, and uh, this is... Um, um, I'll just go ahead and, and read from uh, from LinkedIn. This is from Navid. Uh, he said he recently started working with AI and was wondering what the suggestion for new AI, like for to get started, like how did they get better at, at AI? Because it's more conceptual rather than a framework. Um, so, you know, do you have any sort of recommendations um, as to how to how to get started? Not just learning a framework, but how do you learn and, and level up your AI skills? I mean, I could take, I guess, or at least give my, my two cents and pass it on. Um, I think that's a good question. I I feel like, you know, online um, classes are probably a great resource. You know, I can, if you ask me offline, I can probably link to some that I've at least taken a, a reference to myself, um, but nothing is on top of my mind. But getting a, sol obviously a, a, a basic solid understanding of the fundamentals, as well as getting your, your hands dirty um, with some of like the tutorials and um, projects you have to use PyTorch or, or TensorFlow or whatever to kind of experiment. I think that would be an, an awesome start and really helps you get you an understanding. I think one of the, th the great things about PyTorch and eager mode is you can kind of inspect, play around really easily, which I've just found, you know, years ago getting started, that was that was easy to, to use to kind of um, map my kind of logical fundamental understanding with what's actually happening in execution. Um, but would love to hear others, others answers. Yeah, I mean, I, I can extend on that a little bit. I mean, I, I, I mean, I guess a couple of things I would suggest is that like, you know, 
like PyTorch itself, and I feel really lucky to work with this organization, but it really is, even though it's an OSS package, it really is something that's taken seriously internally. And I think that um, what is to really understand and, and what we're trying to do is uh, really present um, the same tools that we use for reduction from a research and even from a learning standpoint. So um, take that to heart. I also think that, um, you know, in the AI org, we see a large range of people with, you know, professional degrees, very specific in AI areas, all the way to software generalists. And um, I think that broad range shows you that we have some common language. And I think kind of Colin was alluding to this. There's some basic, like just understand basic CS, understand basic abstractions. And I think that the layer that really helps with AI, particularly if you're interested in the modeling side, is also to have this, this idea around probabilistic systems, right? Because usually you think of computers as being very, very binary in outcomes, but reality is what we're reducing here is a probabilistic distribution of an output. So I think it brings those two disciplines together. Um, but realistically, it's no different than I think any any area um, in CS. It just requires a constant learning. Um, and that's what I love about this job too, is that there's so many um, different uh, techniques or something, I'm always learning something new. So I think that as long as you're willing to continually learn, um, that's a really, really valuable asset in leveling up in this field. Cool. Uh, Andrew Ohan, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, I think everything that Dennis and Colin have said uh, is also very true in my experience. I think the other thing I would add is one really, I think, helpful way to learn is to, like read research papers and actually figure out how to reproduce them. Uh, that helps in a couple of different ways in my experience. Like one, I think to actually like, reproduce a research paper, you have to like understand deeply all the different concepts, like whether it's math or some sort of new idea that they use. Um, you know, you're not able to like really reproduce the result unless you're able to like deeply understand that. And two, I think it helps you in a really practical way. So one, you kind of have this like somewhat abstract knowledge about AI and how all these ideas like back propagation and stuff like that are supposed to work. And I think it's a completely different story if you actually go and implement a model like in PyTorch um, that actually tries to simulate some result you actually get down to the nitty gritty details where you're like actually spending hours, right? Debugging like, okay, why isn't my loss going down? Why aren't things converging? And you end up trying and like learning all these different like tips and tricks, like figuring out, you know, how gradient clipping works, how mixed precision might work and things like that. Um, obviously when you're authoring a model in PyTorch and setting up a trainer, all that, you don't really deal with, you know, the math and like all the details around back propagation. But I think if you really want to start off at the fundamentals, that's also a useful exercise, right? Like to deeply go behind the math and the chain rule and everything that goes into back propagation and actually uh, write out an algorithm in Python or even C, C++ if you want to do that to actually back prop and compute gradients. That's also super helpful to develop that really, really fundamental mathematical understanding. Yeah, I, I think that's an interesting approach. Where do you recommend people start out? Like, you know, I, I would imagine that might be too high a cliff to, to, to climb when <laughs> When you're first first starting out so like like how far in would you recommend like doing that i think yeah um you know if if there's interest and i think uh one thing that i pretty frequently see from people who like are interested in getting into like those nitty-gritty details is like after taking you know like uh, a high level deep learning course so for example like one of fast ai's offerings uh they sort of look towards more of an academic offering of ai or deep learning so a pretty common one I see is like uh, the CS231N course, which goes into like uh, a lot of details around computer vision, but also like kind of shows you the math and all those intricacies around backprop and those sort of algorithms. So that's roughly the process like I'd recommend, I think. Cool, thank you. Cool, yeah, I'll add some final thoughts then. Um, I think one thing that's changing now, so actually the first thing I'll say is that I think hammering fundamentals, as Dennis said, is really important like your math and your computer science fundamentals are really important. But I think also another thing that's evolving with recent deep learning is understanding some computer systems is also really important. If you wanna get performance, you have to know a bit of how like some basic computer systems work. So like I would just not discriminate, don't only learn pure ML. Uh, if you want to do some like systems work, I think that helps too. So just learning both at the same time and not being too discriminatory. I think that's, that's the way to go now.
Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's interesting to think, you know, when you say like, don't be discriminatory, it's like, there's a lot of different things like, you know, at play here. It's not just, you know, the math and, and the computer science and stuff going through, but you also have the, the relationship between software and hardware. Um, you know, if you're doing any sort of uh, GPU um, uh, optimizations and things of that nature, like understanding how the system and how hardware works is also very important too. So um, there's a lot of different, like, areas that you can focus on as well. So um, that's another interesting thing too. It's like, you know, as your knowledge gets sharper and sharper and you understand where different things are, it's like you can choose like, oh, I wanna go specialize in a specific thing, um, which is pretty cool. All right, great. So um, don't see any further questions in the chat. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, wrap this here. Um, does anybody on the line uh, have anything else they want to add before uh, I sign off? Any other like documentation you want people to check out? It, the last thing I'll mention on the Torchrex side is please, if you have questions or um, comments, suggestions, leave us an issue on GitHub. We're pretty active monitoring that and we'd love to get back to you. Um, and depending on where it goes from there, especially where, you know, we'd love to have you um, contribute to the library. That's that's something that we're, we're really excited about, the, the growth we're seeing now. So yeah, reach out and we'd love to talk to you. Yes, that's a good point. And uh, there was, um, it, you know, like, as I mentioned before, this is part of an ongoing series and earlier, was it last week, there was a presentation on how and why to contribute tutorials and code to PyTorch. So um, that video has been archived and is available on YouTube. So um, if you go to the YouTube channel for, um, and I think it's also archived on a few other places as well. I'm not quite sure to be honest, but if you go to, uh, let me share my screen, uh, the uh, PyTorch conference, uh, Page. So if you go to this here, I'll share the link in the chat. Um, and LinkedIn, I don't think I'm able to chat to, uh, I don't think my chat messages appear over there, but if you go to pytorchconference22.splashthat.com, um, that will take you to the page of all the different um, streams that we're doing. And if you look on December 15th at two, there was the talk on how to contribute con tutorials and code to PyTorch. Uh, I would highly recommend taking a look at that because that gives you a good primer on um, how to how to contribute. Uh, and then I just want to call out that later this afternoon, we have another stream uh, on uh, PyTorch 2.0 export. So take a look at that that's at 2 p.m. Pacific time, uh, and the engineer will be uh, Yanan Chow. So um, please have all your questions ready, and um, yeah, I we'll hope to see you there. I won't be hosting, but um, I'll be in the audience, um, you know, participating alongside all of you. So again, I want to thank all of you, uh, Colin, Andrew, Dennis, and Rohan, for joining today and uh, giving us your time to talk about uh, Torchrek and FSDP. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.